I'll just go. Okay. Um, yeah, so good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for jumping on. My name is Nick Popovich. I'm the director of sales at HashiCorp, working with all West Coast customers for healthcare, education, and state organizations. I've uh, been with HashiCorp now for about two and a half years. Um, I'm also joined by Dan Fedick. Dan, if you want to introduce yourself, that would be great. Hey, everybody. Uh, solutions engineer here at HashiCorp. I look forward to kind of talking to you and meeting everybody. Thanks, Dan. And then Ryan. Hello, everyone. My name is Ryan Moore. I'm an SA here at Palo Alto, and uh, it's a pleasure to be on the call. Uh, nice to meet everyone, and uh, I'll chat with you guys a little bit later today. Awesome. Thanks, Ryan. So yeah, so the purpose of today's webinar, we're going to talk about how uh, Palo Alto Networks and HashiCorp work together, specifically with Prisma Cloud. And so a few housekeeping items today before we get started. Uh, we just went through introductions. We'll talk about how we got here within the multi-cloud world. Uh, then I'll turn it over to Dan uh, to talk about Terraform and Packer, some of our tooling, how it's going to help you get more lift out of your existing investment with Palo Alto. Um, and then we'll turn over to Ryan. So Ryan's going to focus primarily on Prisma Cloud, but then also talk about how HashCorp and um, Prisma Cloud work better together. And then if we have any questions at the end, we're happy to answer them and then go from there. All right. So if you haven't heard of HashCorp before, uh, we're a multi-cloud automation software company that helps organizations get to cloud quicker. So a lot of organizations are currently leveraging something like a Terraform today, um, but that's really just a start, right, of just provisioning. So if you have multiple clouds or even a hybrid cloud environment, we have a platform out there called Console, which helps organizations communicate from, let's say, GCP to on-premise VMware or vice versa in a secure way. And then kind of like the next phase of evolution of what we've seen within the multi-cloud operating model is within security. So HashiCorp is specialized within secrets management and also privileged access management with our platform called Boundary and also Vault, um, which is help, helping to automate access and encryption within the cloud. And then last but not least is application development. So if you've heard of Waypoint or Nomad, we're really focused on uh, workload orchestration across multiple clouds. And so background on HashiCorp, we currently have over 3,700 customers today, 75 out of the Fortune 500, and are also in over 45 countries. And so the really cool thing about what we have today, which is really just the premise of us talking with Paul Alto, is that if you're using a Paul Alto Networks, if you're using a service now, um, we currently have over 2,000 plus integrations today to where we're helping organizations get more lift out of what they currently have. Um, just through uh, automation and things of that nature. All right, so just setting the stage. So we now live in a multi-cloud world. So if you have VMware on-premise and are adopting at least a single cloud, congratulations, you are you know, a multi-cloud customer. Um, and I think just how we got here today. So back in the 1930s, um, we saw probably the biggest change in how people collected data from going from you know, pen and paper all the way to the mainframe systems of digitizing all that. And so that was like the first big jump in computers. And after that, though, about 60 years later, we saw the client server model being adopted, but really kind of like the biggest change to enterprise IT was with virtualization. So we saw, you know, customers taking a thousand servers and dropping it down to a couple hundred through virtualization, which saved organizations, both healthcare and state organizations, a lot of time and money and just, you know, how they actually went about uh, managing that data. And so since then, we've seen a couple other evolutions with the private cloud, um, just introducing automation to your on-premise data center as they exist today. And then the public cloud, you know, in Amazon or Google, they're going to produce services, which a lot of organizations aren't going to have the capabilities to natively create themselves. So, you know, using services based upon what your customer needs, that's really where we see organizations starting to adopt public cloud workloads. And so bringing all that together is what we call the multi-cloud operating model, the cloud operating model, which is what we're about to talk about today. And so the biggest shift of what we've seen of going from just purely on-prem to off-prem or a multi-cloud world is that we go from an environment with dedicated servers that's homogenous, right? So let's say you own the servers, they're on-premise with VMware, you can always leave that server on. Um, but when we go to the cloud model, what we really look at is capacity on demand. So only need, using servers based upon need and then having them be heterogeneous, right? So um, 
using the Google services versus Amazon services, they're going to have best of breed services that are going to fit your needs in different ways. So being able to capture the value per cloud, that's kind of like what the whole end goal is. But I think to get there, though, we've seen um, a number of challenges just as far as bringing all that together. And so when it comes to tactical cloud adoption, the first challenge that we usually see is disparate workflows. It's very rare that we see an organization going from on-premise VMware to GCP, let's say, and having that workflow completely automated. So the, when it comes to workflows, automation, I think is probably the biggest challenge that organizations face as they try to transition to the cloud and have everything baked out as far as like what it, what it takes to provision a workload within the public cloud. The second kind of key point is infrastructure sprawl. So if you're used to managing your infrastructure on premise with VMware, um, it's pretty easy just to understand like, hey, this is turned on, we manage these servers, that's great. But when we go to the, the multi-cloud domain of having you know, workloads in GCP, workloads in Azure, workloads in AWS, it gets pretty cumbersome just to understand like, hey, what's turned on, where it is, and how do we manage it? And then last but not least are the silo teams and also the growing skills gap. So with silo teams, um, Usually we see teams like security and networking and database. And a lot of times those teams are communicate, um, which can make it a challenge to adopt public cloud services, just going back to the disparate workflows. And then the last kind of key thing is your growing skills gap. So if you're using uh, VMware today on premise or any other virtualization platform, that's great. But to get to the cloud, it's all code based technology, meaning the underlying operating systems and virtualization platform is different from GCP to Azure to AWS. So, you know, how the heck are we going to make sure that we know each specific cloud so that we're proficient and, you know, make sure we can meet the needs of our customers? All right, so I'm going to leave you with three numbers at the end. So the first one is 21%. So 21% of organizations experience negative cybersecurity events due to non-sanctioned IT resources. So when you're going to the public cloud, what we've seen most of our customers and what they've told us is that if you don't have governance and guardrails in place, it's going to negatively affect um, your organization as you're trying to provision resources. Because if it's not, you know, in compliance, you might, you know, leave a, um, a port open, and then essentially it's going to just uh, allow a cybersecurity attack. So overall, like having any governance and guardrails in place, this is probably one of the biggest challenges we've seen as you go to the multi-cloud domain. The second key point is 65%. So when it comes to configuring services within the public cloud, we see a big change from what we call click ops. So clicking around provisioning a VM to infrastructure as code. And so um, if you're gonna stick with the click ops model, it's usually with that, we see a lot of misconfiguration. So you might leave a port open and you're gonna let an attacker in and things like that. Whereas if you have an infrastructure as code file or you know, have that methodology, it's a lot easier to make sure that everything is configured correctly and you can deploy it as need. And then last but not least is 30% and it's related to cloud costs. And so saw this on LinkedIn the other day, thought it was pretty funny, but on the left-hand side, you see a guy who says, hey, how'd you end up in poverty, gambling, and drugs? And the guy on the right hand says, oh, I left the cloud instance on. So pretty humorous, but I think all in all, it's like if you don't have a way to optimize cloud costs, it can be pretty challenging just to make sure it's an effective model. All right, so how is HashiCorp solving these challenges? Well, we're industrializing the cloud adoption through what we call the cloud operating model. And so what we really focus on is the business value of your organization, right? So if you're a hospital or if you're a state organization, we start with the end in mind and we really, really try to automate workflows based upon what your initiative is um, using the technologies within the public cloud. So the second kind of uh, two points go together. So converging the skills gap and also having a platforms team. When it comes to the skills gap, we already talked about specializing in Google versus Azure versus AWS. So what HashiCorp has done, we've created a single tool set that's going to make it easier for teams to adopt multiple clouds without having to specialize on each of those clouds, at least right off the bat. And that kind of goes along with the platform teams, but essentially having a team that's going to consistently collaborate across you know, different orgs so that you're able to provision you know, security, database, server, all on the same team, and they just be able to adopt you know, Google's cloud for service for this specific action, um, so it can meet the end needs of your customer. And then last but not least is central visibility and management, but having a central place that so that your entire team can manage, hey, 
you know, these services are spun up in GCP, these are in Azure, these are in Amazon, things like that. Um, having a central place so that all these things can come together. So with that said, you know, this is how HashiCorp is trying to address at a high level, um, you know, the industrialization of the cloud. And so we'll turn it over to Dan Fedick now. He's going to talk more about Packer um, and Terraform and how that's going to be able to affect your organizations get to the cloud. So Dan, I will turn it over to you. Awesome. Thanks, Nick. Do you think I could uh, switch control real quick? Sure. Absolutely. That'll make it easier for me. All right. So just going to go back to the same uh, window we were here before. So I, I kind of want to talk about this from the perspective of like the story. So I actually have gone through this process from tactical cloud adoption through industrial industrialized cloud adoption, right? So I was I started at a VC, um, you know, a small, not not a VC, but a small uh, startup, and we were VC funded, and we went through to you know kind of becoming a, a large organization that was eventually purchased by a company who purchased a bunch of companies that were kind of similar in in, in style and, and manner. And we went through all of these processes, right? We had, you know, first with tactical cloud adoption, like I, how does this cloud even work, right? Like, so it's the click ops, it's walking through building instances, you know, building S3 buckets, everything's missed, you know, is named weirdly with dashes or underscores. And then we eventually thought, okay, we need to get some, some uh, format around all this. So we have some common patterns and we went through and, and then, um, you know, built a lot of infrastructure as code. We used Packer, and I'll explain that in a minute, to build our images out. And we started really uh, codifying a lot of our, our workflows. Um, and then we eventually got purchased by a larger organization that, you know, now we're working on multiple teams. There's an Azure team, there's an AWS team, there's a, you know, VMware team with, that did all of our on-site uh, physical infrastructure. So we needed to start coming together and really converging these skill gaps and then and building these platforms together and working on common patterns that we could use. And that first step is, okay, you know, when you're about to deploy your application, you need to deploy it on an instance. Well, before you can deploy your instance or your VM, you have to have an image to work off of. So you could use the default image or you could build your own. And typically you don't wanna use the default because there's nothing in it that you can use, right? So the, the first step is, okay, you know, when we first started going through this process was spin up an AMI in AWS, run a bunch of scripts on it, uh, encrypt the, the root volume, and then, you know, place a couple configuration files and then deploy that out as an artifact to the AMI repository, basically. Once I found Packer, because the second time we had to do that, you know, it, it became very cumbersome to remember all the steps I, I had to go through to get that golden image. And then once we found Packer, we were able to codify all those steps and then to make a, you know, a common pattern, um, you know, to deploy all the, these images out into this AMI artifact. And as we started to join these companies together, we realized that we had the Azure team, the GCP team, the VMware team. We had multiple operating systems that we were working with. So we were able to still use Packer. We were able to come together as uh, multiple platform teams and say, okay, what, is the, what are the best practices? Let's create some architectural design records that say these are the best practices for our images, right? So we created a, a pipeline using um, common, so for an operating system, you could have one Packer image, one Packer file that was be able to deploy the same manner across multiple clouds. We were able to deploy, you know, run a bunch of shell, uh, different shell scripts or place files or run Chef or Ansible playbooks or cookbooks, and then deploy those out to different artifacts, whether that's an AMI in AWS, a VM in, in uh, Azure, or, you know, a VM template, a VMware template. So we could have this common pipeline that worked, you know, to build out these images so that we had common uh, tags and common patterns. And now we can work together as an organization and get that, like, quality that you'd want out of an enterprise, right? Um, <clears throat> and so once you built our Packer images, we were then able to go into Terraform, right? And say, okay, now we want to build an instance and all of the surrounding infrastructure that goes along with this application, right? We wanted to create a golden provisioning workflow. We wanted to do that in, in a world where we had multiple clouds, where we had uh, multiple uh, instance types, where we had multiple uh, resources and different API types. So how do we do that with Terraform? And then how do we make sure that we can codify that and then have um, a repeatable pattern that we can use and, and, and iterate as things 
changed in your organization and in your environment. So the first step is, you know, an application developers de de building an application. They're building and testing that application. And, and at, at the beginning, I used to say, OK, if it's a new application, give me 50 percent of the level of effort or 50 percent of the time you would take to the build an application, I need that same amount of time to deploy that application because I need to know what kind of load balancers, what kind of buckets, what kind of encryption, like there's a lot of stuff that goes along with deploying one specific type of application. So as we start, as we started getting that information, we would then, you know, we, we composed all of that infrastructure in, you know, HashiCorp configuration language, otherwise known as HCL. So we'd build out a module using um, Terraform in, in HCL and we compose that, that module. And then we collaborate with multiple teams, create design records. Uh, we'd get multiple uh, people on the same team to you know, do pair coding, to ensure that we've got, you know, we're, we're agreeing on how we wanna deploy this infrastructure. And then we're gonna publish that, that um, module into a private registry. And then we wanna ensure that other people can share that module and we can have workspaces that we can um, publish those registries to we can reuse those in different workspaces. So then we go through this life cycle. So the next time when somebody says, hey, I need this application, well, I have a module that I've worked on. We can iterate if needed, but for the most part, we're saving, we're, you know, we're, we're getting rid of that toil that we would normally have that 50% you know, of the time. Now we're only using 5% of the time, maybe, um, if we've really truly uh, you know, come up with all of the um, attributes and we've we've got this module down and, and the more we go through this cycle the faster things go right so we create this golden provisioning workflow and we want a way that we can do so in a common manner we want to connect normal developer tools uh, we want to integrate with operator tools and we want to extend to any infrastructure <clears throat> and we can do that with terraform and packer right so we, we can use built-in or API-driven connections. We can use tools like ServiceNow to get approval on, you know, I want to build an instance and I want to build it this size so I can integrate with ServiceNow to create a ticket to get approvals to see if I'm allowed to actually build that infrastructure. And then I'll, you know, have my code in GitHub or GitLab or, you know, and, and we'll actually be able to do that pair coding and that um, the review before we do our PRs. And then we'll have Terraform um, you know, go and deploy that infrastructure, or we could use other tools like, you know, CICD, uh, sorry, C Circle CI to be able to run those tools. We could use GitHub Actions if necessary. And then we could also um, use built-in or API-driven integration. So once we've deployed that infrastructure, we want to make sure that it's all audited, right? And we have telemetry and logging data through things like Grafana and Datadog and Splunk. So we can go track and, and ensure that we're not deploying things that we shouldn't be on the backside, right? And we can get events as things change in your environment. And we can do that across, you know, one of the things on a platform team you want to really focus on is, is decreasing the amount of toil you have, right? So in order to, you know, have different, cloud providers working together, you want to have these modules that you can deploy. So using Terraform providers across all these different cloud providers, but also for things like I want to do database installs or database users, or maybe I have an integration with a third party SaaS provider like Snowflake, or even creating GitHub repositories through Terraform as well. We have all these different providers that we can use to be able to basically script all these things out in a common pattern we can have this private registry that we can search and, and reuse those modules within our organization. And again, as we iterate through this process and we come back, we want to be able to have workspace management. We want to see has things changed? Um, you know, do we have drift on our Terraform code or our Packer images? Um, is there, you know, meaning we've done something through ClickOps, but we forgot to affect that thing in Terraform. That's drift detection. Uh, we want to ensure that we have audit logging set up. And then before we deploy infrastructure into the world, we want to ensure that we have policy enforcement. Um, so we do things like use Sentinel, which is, our, which is Terraform and HashiCorp's policy as code uh, mechanism. We also have integrations with things like Prisma Cloud's uh, Bridge Crew, where we can actually run not only scans on the infrastructure we're about to deploy, like for, as far as policy is concerned, but we can actually see is our Terraform code um, secure? You know, are we running, building an S3 bucket 
that has an open, you know, that, that is public or is not encrypted, Bridge Crew can alert on some of these common patterns. So we have integrations with uh, organizations like Prisma Cloud and, and the Bridge Crew integration to check that code and to check that infrastructure before it's getting deployed. And then we can remediate on that as we go through that pipeline over and over again. And so to get started in this, you know, we've got two kind of true uh, types of Terraform. We have Terraform Cloud, so H Terraform Cloud for Business, which is um, a way we can manage Terraform from that you know, centralized place. We can manage organizations and teams and workspaces, share private repositories, <clears throat> and we can do so that so you don't have to host it. And that Terraform is hosted by HashiCorp ourselves, or you can have the self-hosted, um, you can run the Terraform Enterprise inside your organization. Now, just kind of a note for those who are hesitant because you have internal resources, you can use HCP uh, Terraform Cloud for Business, and you can actually run self-hosted runners that can, you know, basically access resources within your VPCs, with that, within your cloud resources, to, um, and then be able to, to still run all of the, the run, the jobs themselves, and to manage the users themselves within Terraform Cloud. So these are our two uh, types of, of Terraform and Packer as well. So there, there's a HCP Packer now that's just released. Um, and then there's also uh, AC, a Packer that you can run as an open source as well. And I'm gonna hand it over to Ryan over at Prisma Cloud. Yeah, start. thanks Daniel. That was great. Um, awesome uh, display there. Let me go ahead and oh. share my screen. Oh, let me see here. Do uh, share, share, share right here. And let me start this slideshow for you. Start at the beginning. Let's do a presenter view. Uh, let me know if you can still see my screen. Everyone good? You're good. Perfect. Uh, I'm going to start out a little bit different. Uh, I heard Nick suggest the 1930s, and that kind of threw me back. I was like, I've never heard someone go way back to the 30s before. That was awesome. But uh, anyways, Prisma Cloud, right? I'm going to kind of talk about a little um, about Prisma Cloud, what we do as a whole, right? And then I'm going to introduce some key concepts here that really tie in with HashiCorp, with Terraform, if you will, and go from there. So Prisma Cloud as a whole, right? We have a bunch of these different pillars, if you will, modules. Basically, the whole idea here is to complete the entire spectrum of cloud, right? Um, this highlighted area right here, this is really what we're going to be talking about today. But this is all about shifting left. Right? We're going all the way over to the IDE of your developers, the ones who are actually writing this infrastructure as code, your Terraform, right? You're over there typing into their IDE. We're applying checks directly live right there and there. We're applying smart fixes. I'm going to go into that here a little bit later, but that's where we want to start at, right? We want to start at that infrastructure level before it ever hits your version control and or before it ever hits the runtime, right? And that's really what we're going to get into Today, we're going to go through some slides just talking about that. But I also want to share what else we do here, just so everyone has a great understanding of what we do as a whole. Okay. So after you write this infrastructure as code, and again, not using these click ops, but if you do, that's fine. And then you get into the posture management things. All right. That's right over here. And what we're really looking at is basically three things, right? We're looking at the visibility, all of those resources in your cloud. And it doesn't matter which cloud, right? It could be Azure, AWS. Google, Alibaba, Oracle, we're bringing IBM in here soon. All of these clouds have different things provisioned in them. And we want to make sure that those are visible to you, right? A lot of times I throw this out here, um, developers, you know, sometimes developers are like children, right? Not picking on developers, but you know, after my kids are done playing in a certain room, they'll leave, the lights will still be left on, right? That could be the same with, uh, with developers, right? Uh, somehow, maybe they didn't destroy that Terraform template, so they left a running machine on. Those are the type of visibilities that we want to find, right? Find them for you, display them. The next point here is policy. We wrap all these policies around. We have 1,200 out of the box, and they're all for different um, resources, right? We want to make sure that they're configured correctly. They're not overly provisioned and so forth and so forth. And then we have compliance. We're wrapping compliance around that. Maybe you want your posture in cloud to be GDPR, HIPAA, NIST, PCI, whatever you may be doing we have all those covered. And that's really the big idea here with posture management. You see data security down here on the side. This is gonna be for your unstructured storage, right? Your S3 buckets or your Azure storage. And what are we doing there? Well, we wanna make sure that you're not exposing data. I mean, that's, that's a key concept. We wanna make sure there's no secrets in there, no IPPI information. And we also wanna make sure there's no malware, right? So we'll scan all that data for you and make sure that everything's secure, okay? 
So after you have that posture, after you have that visibility, we want to look into the workload. All right. We want to make sure that your workloads are secure. We want to make sure that um, they're not doing anything anomalous, any malicious behavior happening with it. And we do this multiple different ways. We have uh, defenders going on for container workloads. Maybe you have orchestrators such as EKS out there. We can go ahead, hit daemon sets up, get those configured. But we also do it for your hosts, right? We do it for functions, serverless, and so forth. And we also have agentless options. Maybe you want just that, uh, that easy, simple scan every 12 hours or even every one hour, highly configurable. But that's really what the workload protection is for. It's about once you get everything up there and running, let's make sure those are secure at the same time, right? We have web app API security. That's the layer seven traffic that we're monitoring. And basically regarding the OWASP top 10 and treating it in such, right? We have cloud security, network security stuff. We do identity-based micro-segmentation. Um, we can talk more about that some other time, but also around here, we uh, secure the identities, right? These are your, uh, the KIMS, if you will, our IAM module. And really what this is focused on is once everything is over to the cloud now, instead of doing your traditional username, um, IP auth, we're really just looking at all of those roles, all of those roles that the services are allowed to talk to each other, identify, et cetera, et cetera. And we need to make sure those are secure too, okay? Um, a, a little story that I like to share here, maybe a developer is working on something, they need their EC2 instance to talk to DynamoDB, right? But they don't have the right templating down, they're not sure what to do, so they just put a big asterisk there. And essentially, they give access to the entire DynamoDB tables, uh, and not just read permission, maybe write, maybe it's lambdas, maybe it's S3, it could be a lot of different things. That's what we're really checking in to identify, okay? So as a whole, I know that was really fast, but I just wanted to share the broad level, what Prisma Cloud does today. Um, and they do pretty much all the stuff here. So with that said, let's go ahead and talk about the code security aspect, right? I heard that Bridge Crew was mentioned a couple of times. I just want to get everyone on the same page. Prisma Cloud, Palo Alto acquired Bridge Crew, I want to say maybe a year ago, maybe a year and a half, I'm not sure, time flies. And that has became wrapped into our cloud code security as it is today, right? So whenever you hear someone mention a Bridge Crew or Chekhov, just think of that as Prisma Cloud, it's cloud code security. So those, those um, go into each other quite well, same thing. So why is this important? And a lot, what are some challenges that organizations are faced with? And why are we even at this point? Why are we talking about it, right? Well, in, in a nutshell, developers, while they're really, really good at writing out their code, getting APIs out there, uh, pushing out stacks, sometimes they're not greatest with security, right? And it's just because there's a lot of it. There's so many resources coming out. I mean, you look at AWS reInvent, they're just offering more and more services. It's pretty much like a JS framework these days. It's really hard to stay up on the security. So that's what we're offering here, right? We're making sure that, hey, we understand that developers, let's keep them focused on developing, and then we'll take care of the security, right? Security comes out of um, cycles, right? A lot of agile forces, a lot of um, moving uh, parts quickly, et cetera. And then you lose connection between what's in build time and what's in runtime. And then we have solutions for that, right? So that's kind of what we're going to talk about. A couple other things here that were found out by our Unit 42 teams is that, and this is pretty stunning. So if you're utilizing third-party sources, different Terraform modules, and every, um, et cetera, we found that 64% of these, that you can just randomly get on GitHub and everything like that, have one high or critical insecure uh, misconfiguration. And that's huge. I mean, just there alone, chances are today you're utilizing all these third-party uh, vendors uh, that you're going to have some misconfigurations and you may not know about them. And this can obviously lead to vulnerabilities in your system, right? The big step here, right, and the big challenge and the whole reason this shift left comes into play is one is alert fatigue. So let's just think about this concept here, right? You have one misconfigured uh, resource block or one vulnerable repo that you have here, right? And this gets pushed out. This gets pushed out to your R&D clusters, staging, QA, what have you, and eventually goes to production without being caught. Well, this one misconfigured um, resource block can turn into hundreds of deployments, which will then ultimately when you're looking at this with your posture and your runtime, it's going to create thousands of alerts just based on this one misconfigured resource. And what happens is this now turns into alert fatigue, one thing. Then you have to start creating your JIRA tickets, right? Maybe some managed tickets. Maybe you're getting all these alerts sent over to some other integration, such as Slack or something like that. And that just creates a lot of overhead. In the meantime, if you kind of get this going now and checking this at the IDEs, checking it before it makes it its way into your favorite version control, checking it before it makes its way into runtime, right? With the tooling that I'll talk about here in a little bit. Well, you can save all this time. You're not wasting your cycles looking at why didn't we catch this before it made its way in production, right? We're catching it now. We're catching it before it makes its way to runtime and therefore decreases all of those alerts that you would be getting if you weren't doing it in this solution, right? 
that's really what we're talking about here. Again, I understand that, you know, a lot of people utilize Terraform and that's great. But if you don't, that's fine too. We can do multiple different styles at build time, right? We're talking your CloudFormation, ARM, BICEP, um, and even out, outside of infrastructure as code, right? Maybe you have Docker files that are in your version control that we're going to scan for you. Maybe you're utilizing orchestrators uh, that use Helm or Kubernetes manifest files. We can check that as well. And again, it's cloud agnostic, right? It doesn't matter the orchestrator you're running. It doesn't matter which cloud, AWS, Oracle, doesn't matter. The whole idea here is you use what you want to use, and we're here to protect every aspect of it, all right? So when we talk about developer tools, typically a long time ago, but people would say, you know what, you have to use Visual Studio Code. Uh, we're only using Perl, right? I said old time, so I'm going to bring up Perl, right? We're only utilizing uh, Jenkins for our CI. Well, that's not the way it is anymore, right? Developers get to choose whichever IDs they want to use. They can do different version controls. Teams are... Not that they're siloed, but there's a, a, a lot of different teams out there, right? You have a different microservices, some teams working on that, security teams working on this. So what the whole idea here is, you choose whatever you want to choose, and we are able to integrate with that. You see, we give different um, options up here. Just take your CI platforms, right? Your Jenkins, HashiCorp, GitHub Actions, CircleCI, CodeFresh, doesn't matter. We can interact with all of them, and that's the whole idea. We'll talk a little bit more about these here later, and we'll break some of them down. A little history around... Bridge Crews, AKA Chekhov. Um, Chekhov is the open source foundation of this, right? And the reason why we actually like to show this is because it's the most commented, the most downloaded, the most utilized repo on GitHub for infrastructure as code. And this is great because of the fact, and I mentioned that in today's terms with cloud, it's literally like a JS framework. Something new is happening all the time. Well, when something new does happen, when AWS creates a new service, well, people have to start writing policies on that, right? With Chekhov, all those policies are created almost immediately by the open source community. We then get the succession of that and pull those up to Prisma Cloud, all right? With Prisma Cloud, we add onto this, and this is where Bridge Crew comes in, right? Bridge Crew, Prisma Cloud, Co Cloud Security. Um, this is where we're looking at the PR comments. We can come in there, we can audit it. I'll show you some of those features later. Later, we have these smart fixes, and this is amazing. Typically, what would happen is maybe you'll get an alert saying, hey, this resource is misconfigured, it's missing a certain flag, please fix it. And then what happens is your developer is going to have to go out to Google or their favorite search engine and type in how to fix X, Y, Z. Then they'll get some um, more information and maybe they have to play with that a little bit. What we do is we actually provide the smart fix for you. We'll provide you the link showing you how to fix it, but all you do is all point and click here. You can just click on a button and we'll actually inject that code for you to fix the solution. Much easier, much better, much uh, a lot more saving in time, right? We allow for centralized views and the UI. It's a single pane of glass. I'll show you a little bit of this later. And think of that as your 10,000 foot view. You can literally come in here, track a project at a high level and see all those differences that are needing to be fixed and so forth. Okay. So let's talk about some of these capabilities that we have built into this. This is the infrastructure's code security. What we're looking at here is a repo that has been ingested into our UI. And we can go down and we're checking all of this information here. It doesn't matter if this was on a PR, it doesn't matter if this is just um, certain branches. We're pulling in the repo. We're checking everything over because we know maybe you started a long time ago with infrastructure as code, and congratulations to you. That's great, right? And you might not just be starting out in, um, right now where someone's typing in the IDE. So how do we check that? We're going to pull in all those repos for you. Again, it doesn't matter which version control it is. We can work with many of them out there. And this is the UI, right? You're going to see which ones are critical. Over here is kind of cut off, but you can see where we can apply those smart fixes. We can actually make the change here inside of the UI, right? And then we can go ahead and push out a PR based on your um, request here. We can do that through our UI. Very nicely done. SCA, right? We always want to make sure, hey, we're, we're not just covering your infrastructure's code in these repos, right? Maybe you have some um, Python app. Maybe you have a Ruby app. Well, we're going to look at all the third-party development frameworks that are added onto this, right? We're going to make sure, hey, are those critical? Are you utilizing an old version here that has some um, uh, high vulnerability, some high findings? We're going to let you know that as well. So again, it's not just covering infrastructure's code portion. It covers other things. And including on that is even the container image scanning. So before it becomes a container, obviously, it's an image. Maybe you're using Docker. Maybe you have Docker on here, you're adding in packages, you're adding in um, uh, RPMs, et cetera, et cetera. We can go ahead and scan that now before it even makes its way into runtime, before you add it to your registry after your builds are successful and so forth. So a lot of different aspects here that are included inside of this infrastructure as code, cloud code security piece, okay? 
Um, a couple of other things that we do, obviously we wanna make sure that you're not uh, having secrets in your identity block. So I don't wanna see your information end up on pastebin someday. So that's really important. We're gonna make sure that you're not pushing this type of stuff out to your version control system. And you can utilize Checkoff here. Bridge Crew also has a CLI. Um, there are some differences to it and I can explain that at a later time. Um, we're making sure of least privileged I am. Now this slide is a little interesting, uh, full transparency. I don't really do slides. Our sales counterpart, unfortunately, was not able to make today's call. But this Air I am, it's a little off, right? Uh, we do this ourselves. We have this built in-house for Kim. This is our I am module. So this is how we uh, do drift detection, all right? The big play here is basically making sure that once something got pushed in to your default branch, this is how it should be in runtime. If there's a change made in runtime, if someone does the click ops, developer goes in there, makes a quick change, maybe it's a security group, maybe it's a VPC uh, load balancer, it doesn't really matter. We're going to go ahead and alert you to that and say, hey, you know what, we'll give you a split view, kind of like a diff of what's happening in runtime versus what's happening in version control, all right? It's not utilizing Air IM, so I'm going to definitely remove that slide in the future. The software supply chain, this is your 10,000 foot view. This is what I was talking about earlier. It's going to allow you to come in here at a high level click on whichever project you're currently at, or just want to browse through all of them. And you can see everything that's included in the repo, what Terraform files may be vulnerable. Do I have any Docker files that I need to pay attention to for vulnerabilities? It's all point and clicking. You just come in here, get that nice UI view, okay? We have a lot of different integrations here, right? Maybe at build time, you have some ad hoc set setups. Maybe you're still utilizing shell scripts to get this all built together. That's fine. You can utilize our Chekhov CLI and or Bridge Crew CLI. Okay. Basically, the big difference here is Bridge Crew just adds on to that. All right. Uh, the Chekhov CLI. With Bridge Crew, you can post these findings to the UI in Prisma Cloud. Chekhov, not really. Um, so, yeah, you can utilize this as your CLI. That's fine. It's not an issue. IDE integrations. This is what I was talking about before. Doesn't matter if you're using, utilizing some IntelliJ, um, JetBeans IDE, uh, PyCharm. You can utilize Visual Studio Code. This is great. You're coming in here as a developer, writing out your resource blocks. Maybe you're creating an EC2. You got to add on some security groups and so forth. This red highlighting in here, this is what's great. We're going to go ahead and allow you to hover over this. And this is all real time. This is as you type it. And we're going to give you a smart fix here if there's a problem. We're going to tell you what that problem is. And again, instead of you going out, looking into Google, why this is happening, uh, we're going to allow you to just click on this, inject uh, the code for you, and you're done. That way, before, again, it makes its way up that line, makes it into GitHub. Right there and there, you know you have it fixed. So really awesome aspect here. Again, it works out with three out-of-the-box ones that I know of, Visual Studio Code, PyCharm, JetBeans, um, and so forth. But amazing. I absolutely love this part. Uh, it's really fun to demo as well. The CI integrations, again, we don't, we don't care what you use. Use whatever you want. We can interact anything with any CI out there. And this is for making sure maybe you have some thresholds, right? So maybe you have a build process and your build process says, you know what, I want to make sure uh, nothing out there is of a critical alert or a critical misconfiguration. If it's not, then we'll go ahead and pass that as a build or you failed as a build. So we have placeholders in there. We have thresholds that you can go ahead and check on. Um, and again, if this was code fresh, you just go in here, the build's running out. If there's a high or critical finding or even medium, depending on what your SLAs are, we can go ahead and block that build from happening. We'll fill it out and we'll go and show you directly why it failed. And you can get this feedback based in the console and or in the UI. It's uh, completely interactable. It's configurable, however you wish to have it. Again, with uh, version control integrations, right? A popular, this is a popular one. Automatically today, most of you that are utilizing this probably have some type of auditing. Perhaps um, a developer pulls down um, the, the, the repo, creates a hot fix, a new feature branch, if you will, types in their changes, makes everything to it. They want to post it up. They push it out to their uh, the repo, and now it looks good. It's time to create a pull request on this, right? So they do the pull request. What generally happens traditionally is that you'll have a few reviewers, right, to make sure everything looks good, and then do that type of audit, however that goes into your cases, before it gets pushed up into your uh, and merges into the main or default branch. What we do here is we have our bot sitting at the same feature level, and we're doing the checks for you. No more manually checking to making sure maybe a senior level developer is looking to make sure maybe the junior didn't make a mistake. We're going to go ahead and set that threshold the same way we would at the CI level, right? We're going to do uh, our own checks, make sure everything looks good based on the thresholds that you set. Um, so for example, this one in this screenshot found something low. Maybe if you have it set to block anything lower or higher, we're going to block this out for you, making sure that you're not able to merge this. 
will also provide you the fixes. You can fix this literally inside of the PR. Uh, it will generate a new PR, of course. That will be fixed, and then it will be ready to be merged into your default branch. So that's the GitHub comments. That's how we do it with auditing for our visual uh, or our version control systems. Really great feature. It just helps out the flow tremendously. You can also find this in the UI. The reason why we do this at the version control integration level, we don't want developers having to do new things, right? We want them in their usual workflows. You don't have to touch Prisma Cloud, okay? You can see this directly in your IDE. You can see it at GitHub. You can see this in other places. You don't have to go to Prisma Cloud to fix these issues. You just have to set it up once. That's really it. Make sure I got the right one. And did I get the right? Yeah. So on deployment, right? So after this, after everything's checked in, what's the next logical step? Next logical step is deploy stuff out. And it doesn't matter if it's just cloud resources or you're starting to deploy out your workloads. This is where we're coming in and we're talking about the workload security, uh, the workload protection. We can do registry integrations, scan your images and so forth. Kind of a different topic. So I'm not gonna talk too much here, but this gets more into the other aspects of Prisma Cloud and what they do, okay? The greatest thing about this is the centralized view. Everything here is in one UI. You don't have to glue things together. You don't have to have all different UIs here. You don't have to keep track of payment systems for all these different things. Everything's here. You can see up here, you have your posture management. You have your policies in place. You have your code. This is the Prisma Cloud code, cloud security. You can see it in action here. You have your compute section, identity-based micro segmentation. Everything's in one place for you. No need to have glued together applications running, losing track of them and so forth. And that's really the big win, right? Let's keep everything in one platform, completely the entire cloud spectrum and so forth. And that's really it. You know, I, I just wanted at a high level, share what we're capable of doing, how this kind of ties in with HashiCorp, how we can mix together and kind of like build together better, right? We do the whole cloud native security, very compre uh, comprehensive, full cycle, and it's for any cloud. Thank you. If there is any questions, please ask them. But uh, I appreciate the time that you guys gave us. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. We appreciate it. Uh, yes, yeah, so for everyone on the call, if you all have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat. Um, I think just as next steps, though, uh, what we're all prepared to do, if you're interested in just like seeing a demo of this live and you're an existing policy customer, um, Dan and I are happy to hop on a call and kind of walk through what that workflow would look like. Um, but yeah, at this point, any questions from anyone on the call? All right, I will take that as a no. So uh, just as next steps, we'll send out a follow-up with a couple of the links that we reviewed today. Um, and like we said, if, if you're interested in seeing a live demo, Dan and I and even Ryan are happy to hop on the call and just walk through what that workflow would look like. Um, but from the HashiCorp team and also the Paul Alta team, appreciate you all hopping on and I hope, hope you have a good rest of your week. Take care. Thank you, everyone. See ya. Thanks, everybody.